Good morning, everyone. My name is Janice, the one of the co-hosts of Two Sistas, and today is Fantabulous Friday. I believe it's, it's September 16th. I'm off on my days, as always. I do apologize. Carol Sue won't be able to be with us today, and she'll be back with us next week. But, you know, what is amazing about podcasting and hosting us is we've really been able to meet so many amazing people. And I'm so excited to have on as our guest today, Patricia Colesa. Welcome to the Two Sisters podcast. Thank you for having me, Janice. Um, obviously, we're excited to have you here. And I thank you so much for um, you know, hopping on the preach podcast chat. And what I love about <laughs> your approach to wellness is really, I think, very different and unique. And we all need to hear different wellness, wellness strategies. So why don't we start out with, um, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this field. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of my favorite topics. So growing up, I spent a lot of time with my family looking at nutrition labels and cooking a lot of foods at home. And we kind of grew into, you know, an athletic background. My mom was a phys ed teacher. And so I had all of these different nutrition and wellness concepts being brought into my life. So I knew I wanted to be in healthcare and I wanted to be able to help other people. So that kind of led me to eventually be a dietetics major in college, had no idea that being a dietitian was even a thing. Um, and so what happened was I ended up following that path because I knew that that would be the most opportunity and that dietitians are really still growing um, and being more available to people you know, around the world. So I, I graduated with my bachelor's degree from Rutgers. And then I went on to do our required dietetic internship in order to become a dietitian. And then from there, I had focused in sports nutrition entrepreneurship, um, kind of switched up a little bit since then, thought I wanted to work with athletes. Then I, I knew though that I wanted to have sort of a business mindset. So from there, I became a dietitian and right in the middle of the pandemic, summer of 2020, and since then, I like to tell people I've been almost everywhere. I've worked with people with weight loss surgery. I've worked with athletes. I've worked with people with heart disease, diabetes, you name it. I've, I have been there. So now I'm currently working in the hospital. Um, it's been a little, about a year and a half now. And I work with a lot of older adults. So that's kind of where I'm at. And then on the side, I've been trying to speak on these po on podcasts, trying to speak to wider audiences, especially women who are provided with all of this nutri nutrition information and don't know how to kind of it and figure out what's best for them. Sorry about that. No problem. This is what happens with the beauty of live podcast. Thank you so much for explaining that. And I think it's really important to know someone's background. Obviously at a young age, you know, you were exposed to so many different things in the healthcare industry, reading labels. Um, you know, I can remember briefly showing my son how to read a label, but we, a lot of parents, I think, don't realize how important that is to kind of start off early. So kudos to your family for, for doing that and kind of introducing you in that field. Now, um, I think that, you know, you followed a path that was, you were destined to follow. I will just say that. And I, and I think that's amazing. When you decided to become a dietitian, obviously it was a natural progression, but you really took that a step further to really define your niche. I know that you, you said you're working in the hospital right now, but you're also working with different individuals, you know, athletes, um, you know, different um, people, older people with issues, people that have gone through weight loss surgery. As a dietitian and a professional in that industry, um, <laughs> excuse me, and I'm a health coach. So there, there is a different, and I just want to, you know, so everyone knows a dietitian is very different from a health coach. Um, 
you obviously are more of the professional with, with all the training and that sort of thing. I have found, for instance, and I just want your your take on this as a dietitian, as a health coach, I've worked with many people who have undergone weight surgery. And what I find about disturbing about weight surgery, and, and this is just my personal feeling on it, if the individual who is considering such a drastic thing, if they're not dealing with the issues that got them there, many of the patients that I work with that have gone through weight loss surgery have gained it back and then some. I see a lot of that far too often. What would your advice be to someone who is at that point that really does need to consider that surgery, how they make how they make that best decision for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I'm totally on board with everything that you mentioned. I was working in the weight loss surgery for about when I was first a diet, when I first started out and it was very difficult because number one, I was, it was my first job and to, you know, see these people having all of these other things going on and then, you know, immediately pursuing weight loss surgery. It, it was a lot. Um, so for example, I've had people come in where they might be working six days a week, or they might be eating one meal a day. So there's a lot of additional issues that unfortunately can't always be solved by undergoing the surgery. And a lot of people, um, you know, they're very much educated by their doctor and hopefully a dietitian and what the surgery is, but just to kind of give our listeners a background, if they haven't undergone the surgery, it is, it's required that the stomach is, it becomes smaller. So with that, um, there's only a very limited amount of foods that people can eat when they have the surgery. And it starts with having liquids and they're only allowed four to six ounces. So imagine like a cup of water, half a cup of water mm -hmm. at a time. So my advice to anybody who's considering the surgery, um, many people say they've done a lot of diets prior. Uh, my best advice is try to seek a dietitian or a nutrition professional if your insurance allows and someone who can really work with you and kind of address your individual needs. Because more often than not, you know, like I said, there were people coming in that already had these super busy schedules and then you have to integrate this whole new way of living into your life so you also need to have the time to dedicate to that and have the right support in place in order to undergo the surgery it's a very difficult process and it's it's very difficult to talk about so i, I do also appreciate you bringing it up um thank you for that and i i so appreciate your take on that from from um, being a dietitian and working at that type of center. And you had mentioned something that really stuck out to me that they need to have time to dedicate to that new lifestyle. So you're looking at, this is the way I envision it. You're looking at two different hearts, right? Over here is the hard Oh my, you know, I'm considering weight loss surgery. Um, I know I need to lose weight um, and weight loss surgery is over here. But if I took a different lifestyle approach, well, this is a different lifestyle approach, but I'm going to lose weight right away. I don't think, and I could be totally wrong and I'm just speaking off the cuff. I don't think they're choosing their heart and choosing it wisely. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I think, you know, for women especially, and I know that this does happen with some, some men, when we undertake to change our lifestyle, like it is hard, but we see, um, we see over here that we can have the surgery and lose the weight. And that makes me sad in a way because they're two hearts. Absolutely. I agree. And it's sort of, and we're not able to really 
I guess, recognize what kind of changes to be made until we actually go through it and we're walking through the process. So it's definitely, you know, we can be told all we want. And in the beginning, we're like, yeah, like I can do it. That's easy. And, and listen, I, I've had people who have undergone the surgery and have had success and have been able to make those changes. But I, just like you, I have seen people who have gone through it and have struggled so much and their life has drastically changed for maybe almost years sometimes. So it's, unfortunately, we can't promise that, you know, getting that surgery will guarantee success, especially long-term, like you said, with people gaining the weight back and not being able to maintain those lifestyles that they had when they first got it. You know, and, and that brings me back to a conversation I have with one, one of my health coaching patients a couple of years ago that came to where I was working and I was their assigned health coach. They had had husband and wife, both had the uh, weight loss surgery. They wanted to try this new program and they did okay for like the first month, but then things started happening and they started gaining the weight back. And I specifically remember two professionals, wonderful people, very busy. And I specifically remembering the husband saying to me, well, you know, this is, and I just sat back and I listened. This is like all your fault, you know, blaming it on me or the program. And, you know, I listened with great intent and I took notes and I felt really sad for this person. What, what stuck out to me with that was when he said, you know, we have to go through, you know, McDonald's and we have to do this. And I'm like, I said, excuse me, let me interrupt you right there. So you're blaming me. Let me see if I understand this correctly. You're blaming me because you had to stop at McDonald's. Did I miss something there? And they looked at me and in that moment, I almost, I almost felt um, as a health coach that maybe I overstepped my bounds, but I didn't. And he looked back at me and was like, well, no, you weren't. And I think in that moment, he had a realization that he and his wife really had to take, um, take responsibility. We're all responsible, you know, responsible for our own actions. And long story short, they ended up being more successful, of course. But it, it just always brings me back to if we're not dealing with the issues that got us there to where we are in our health. I know it's hard. Like I talk about it all the time. Obviously being a health coach, um, you know, I've lost over a hundred pounds. It was not easy. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a lot of hard work. It's di the journey I can say is different for everyone, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. And having the right tools in place um, to be able to maintain and keep the weight off long-term is very difficult because um, our lives are just constantly changing on a daily basis, especially with everything going on now. Um, we have to recognize that, you know, um, everything can change in a second and we just have to have some small things in place and, and have be confident enough to kind of um, maintain those practices that are recommended by our doctors, health coaches, dietitians, et cetera, um, to, you know, have success. Wow. You're right. And, you know, which leaves me, I was thinking about that show I often stumble upon. Um, I don't remember the doctor's name, but it showcases, you know, very, um, obese people that desperately need that type of surgery but I don't know if you know which program I'm talking about but it's I think it's called my 600 pound life or something like you that. read my mind I was gonna ask <laughs> yeah. I, I'm almost positive that that's the name of the program mm -hmm. but anyways I I always end up crying when I watch that show because it breaks my heart mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And unfortunately it's, it's very scary because not, not only that, but they, they grew into these other things and there's other prevalent issues. Like I know that I've had people that have been very severely obese that are are depressed. Um, They don't have enough income to support healthy lifestyles. Um, They don't live near, let's say a, a place with a fresh, safe produce and, or maybe a safe walking space in order to get their exercise in. So a lot of those things can eventually lead a person up to that point as well. Um, Not on top of maybe them feeling like they're not able to make the necessary changes for the health. Yeah. And you, you hit something on the nail there. Um, The depression that ensues when one is in that I don't want to say that trap, but that entrapment in, you know, groceries, we all know is very expensive these days. So now you're adding on all these extra things and it's almost like that snowball effect and not having the availability to get healthy produce, you know, to buy make healthy choices, um, you know, to go to see a dietitian or a health coach, whatever it may be, um, again, makes me a, a little sad. And unfortunately, that's the way things are right now. Now, I, I know that you also said that um, you work with um, athletes and, you know, with different sports medicine type of things. Mm-hmm. When you work with an athlete, when they come to you, what are their, like, what are their concerns? I'm sure that they would be somewhat similar, but of course, different. Right. So when I was actually working with the United States rowing team a few years ago as a sports nutrition intern. So this was back before I became a dietitian, but what's really cool is I still have a lot of experience and knowledge from that. Um, And one of the biggest things for athletes is performance. They want to be able to excel and perform, especially when you have a high performing team like the United States rowing team, for example. So a lot of what we had to do um, work, I was working under an awesome sports dietitian, and she's now one of my biggest mentors. She was really having me set up a lot of recovery for the athletes. Um, Most of them were working out about two hours at a time. So they're using up a lot of energy. Their muscle is breaking down from all the the rowing and the lifting and um, Mm -hmm. as well as, you know, making sure that we're fueling them enough. So then they're able to go for a second workout if that's another thing that, you know, is required. So um, their needs are definitely, you know, they have the average three meals a day, but we have to consider, you know, incorporating snacks um, for muscle recovery, for energy levels, making sure that um, the amount that they sweat is replaced with hydration, like our water and electrolytes. So there's, it's really interesting because, you know, as in different areas, there's so many different areas of nutrition and everybody needs to be addressed in such a different way. And I think that that can be very difficult um, in retrospect, because we're given so many things online, but uh, understanding that, you know, athletes have a different lifestyle, weight loss surgery, it looks different. Um, The average person has different needs. So just like trying to kind of tweak things for everybody's like individual needs and things like that. Yeah, I remember uh, my brother is a national world figure skating gold medalist. And I remember his coach, you know, speaking with my parents about nutrition, you know, because he was on the ice, you know, four to six hours a day. And, you know, his nutrition was different from the other five of us. My parents had six children. So, you know, I remember that always going on way back when, and I think that was really before dietitians came into play. Um, So thank you for explaining that. And I would imagine with rowing too, as you said, I mean, it's such a physical sport, like they are burning a shit ton of calories. Yes. Yep. And it's funny story. Um, even prior to this, I was working with football. I was working with cross country, uh, basketball, and 
they all, you know, you have people like football players are, are tall and they're big. And so they're eating like maybe three to four meals a day. And then they have their shakes, they have um, their protein bars. So, you know, everybody, we're just trying to kind of fill in those gaps where they might be working for long periods of time and they need that nutrition or additional vitamins and supplementation. And hydration, my sister and I always talk about hydration, (laughs) excuse me. And I know that as a health coach, you know, the rule of thumb is you take your weight, you divide it in half. That's how many ounces you should, you should drink. However, there's always an exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. For instance, that couple I was explaining, they were in the hundred ounce um, mark or above. And, you know, we, we tell them you really, because of the medications that you're on, you really need to con- also consult with your physician because drinking too much water, especially with being on a lot of medication can really wreak havoc and cause your electrolytes and everything to be totally out of whack. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially if, you know, since we're talking about weight loss surgery patients, I've seen ranges, but normally it's required that they have the more than the 64 ounces a day that's mm-hmm. typically recommended. Um, but yeah, with like, a, funny, um, you mentioned that because um, hydration was a big part of working with the athletes as well. We actually did take like urine tests to see that they were adequately hydrated and a rule of thumb that we used to use was um, the yellowing um, of it like if it was darker you were probably dehydrated and if it was light clearer you were over hydrated so if anyone's ever you know feeling like they might be dehydrated that's like one example of how to kind of take notice of of that um, as Mm. well Um, but you should in that case we would um, try to give them the water amount that they would sweat when they were working out. So replacing the ounces lost there. Gotcha. Now with working with athletes or, you know, even patients in general, obviously you've come into a lot of protein shakes. What are your, what is your favorite protein shake and what is maybe a protein shake that you see in the store, obviously with reading labels, that you're like, "Mm, stay away from that one? Good question. Um, Personally, I like to use protein shakes as sort of a last resort Mm -hmm. because I always say food first, um, if we can allow that. And protein shakes can be really helpful in being like a snack um, or if for one day, let's say you're unable to have a meal, it could be, it could potentially be a meal replacement, but I don't recommend it being a long-term thing. As for brands itself, I've, I've had, you know, so many different ones I've worked with over the years. Um, But the one we use here is the Insure, and that can be found in pharmacies and in um, regular brand stores like warehouses. Um, And I know that the weight loss surgery patients, a big one was the Premier as well, because that's typically lower in sugar and it it was pretty high in protein. Um, So we'd recommend about two shakes a day because they were unable to take the regular solid food. Um, um, The one, I don't have any offhand that, you know, I'd, I'd be very Um, against, but in general, when looking for protein shakes, my recommendation is trying to look for, you know, small, shorter lists of ingredients if possible. Um, Also for any, if you have any allergies, just recognizing or intolerances, recognizing maybe um, what might not sit well with you. Cause I, in the past, I have had patients who they haven't had shakes before, and then they drink it and find out that they, it, causes a reaction. Um, So it's kind of on an on very individual basis with those. um, And also looking out for maybe like a low, low sugar type of protein. So then in that case, you can add on fruit and milk and other things to kind of give it that flavor you're looking for. Hmm, Good points. Thank you so much. And Mm -hmm. of course, I recently had the insure shake last week, when I had to go for my HIDA scan and it was dark chocolate and it was amazing. Just saying. 
Good to know. Yeah, yeah. here we only have the vanilla, strawberry, and the regular chocolate. So oh. I wish we could offer more flavors. Get the dark chocolate. Put in a requisite for that, please. <laughs> good. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to for sure. Yeah, it's really good. Um, this has been so amazing. I have so many other questions. When a patient, for instance, comes to you, what is the process? Because I think I think some people may, I don't want to say be misguided, but they may be a little confused on how that process works. Like, okay, I need, my doctor said, I need to work with a dietitian. All right, now what do I do? And what's the process? Yeah. So I, let me talk a little bit about when I was working in the outpatient setting, cause that was when I was really working with clients one-on-one -on -one a lot more. So with what happens is, is the first thing is if you have insurance, um, there are dietitians that they offer that sign up for the website. So you can kind of go through a list of what dietitians are close to you, what maybe what you can find online. I know that there's plenty of dietitians on doing telehealth now, which is really great. And mm -hmm. then finding a dietitian that aligns with your needs. So for example, let's go with weight loss surgery, since we've been talking about that today, that, you know, there's bariatric dietitians, um, you find the ones that have, are be able to accept your insurance. And there's also the option of self-pay as well. It's a little bit more expensive. So I always recommend if you do have the insurance, that's great. And then typically they'll put like a, a bio about themselves and say, oh, this is what I offer. This is how I'm going to help you. So reading that, seeing how you feel initially, and then what'll happen is you go for that first appointment. And typically what the dietitian does is they'll look over, okay, what are we working with? So for example, how do you typically eat on a normal day? What kind of exercise is in place? Maybe what kind of exercise is available to you in the future? How much are you having to drink? And maybe any social support or any challenges that might arise as you're going through the process. So what the biggest thing about working with the dietitian is they look at not only just the nutrition side, but they try to cover the other areas to make sure that you're able to reach your health related goals in a way that's comfortable to you. So it's, it's very integrative, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And they normally, we normally try as dietitians to recommend small changes that are realistic to you. We'll try to ask you, okay, how do you feel about uh, making A, B, and C change? And then you kind of work together. And it's surprisingly enough, some dietitians will text their clients on a daily basis and kind of check in to see how they're doing and let them ask questions. So it's a very like open communication, which is really great. There's just so much that goes into it. Oh, thank you so much for explaining that process because like, I didn't even think of that, like that you could look as where you were ch chatting about bariatric type of stuff that re really you could niche it down and work with someone who has that expertise and experience in that field mm -hmm. and having that op open communication, I think is, you know, so, so very important to the experience you know, success of reaching those goals. <laughs> I want to ask you some questions about reading labels. Okay. Since you are an expert at this. When, what is the process? I know, obviously you pick up the can and you read it. But when you look at a product that maybe you're not familiar with, as a dietitian, what are you looking for? Like what gets your attention when you're reading a label? Yeah, absolutely. So the biggest thing for me personally, is I try to look at, um, like, how is it going to cover my personal needs? So I try to balance meals. So that might look like looking at how much protein does it have? How much carbohydrates is it going to provide me? Maybe how much fat is in it? Um, you can see on the, the, like right of the nutrition label, it'll say percentages. So that's what's called the percent daily value. So that's maybe how much of percent of it should be recommended in a day. And then there's also the serving size. So trying to kind of 
you know, for each serving, there's this much percent of what you need, what you'll get in any given day. So with that, you know, of course, not everybody is, it's not easy for us to just measure out servings, but it mm -hmm. gives you an idea of maybe how to portion your foods and like, what, what does that look like um, in retrospect? So with nutrition labels, another thing is looking at the ingredients. So like, usually it's recommended that the less ingredients, the better um, generally, but, you know, just and also what'll happen is the first ingredients that are listed are usually the ones that are most prevalent in any given product. So that's what they use the most of. So those are just a few general things to look out for when it comes to nutrition labels. Oh, thank you so much. That is such a great, um, great reference to, you know, go back to and, and really look at those things in particular. If a what do you think is, and I know people talk a lot about sugar and now I'm thinking of when I was, uh, went to IIN and they were talking about the seasonal seven right before um, Halloween, which is honestly now the seasonal 21 with the pandemic and everything that's happened these last few years. What is your take on sugar? We all know we all know it's kind of bad, but let's face it, it's kind of good. Yeah, yeah, it's I've, we've gotten so many, so much confusion about sugar in recent years because we're told, oh, don't have chemicals that you can't pronounce, like artificial, let's say like artificial sugars, but don't have too much sugar or don't have too much fruit because it has too much sugar. So my best advice to anyone who's confused about sugar is you absolutely are allowed to have foods with sugar in them. It's just being mindful. How does that, how much is that looking like throughout your day? Um, are, is, are you having mainly sweet things? Are you balancing that out with foods like your, your protein with your carbohydrates, um, like starches, and maybe like a little bit of fat, like that, having that balance and mixture of different things, you know, it's absolutely okay to enjoy an ice cream with like a, with family a couple times a week, because that's part of, that's part of also, you know, your experience and being able to um, go have these memories and go through life, you know, um, but with it, with sugar, if you are looking for sort of like a mindful approach where it's, it's very balanced and you're not getting too much is um, looking for added sugars. Um, that's one thing to definitely be aware of if possible. It's usually recommended not to have more like more than um, 28 grams of sugar in any given day, which is the average. But of course, there's sugar in many different things now. So to, I'm sorry, were you going to say something? I, I was going to say 28 grams a day. So that's uh, seven teaspoons if I'm Money. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's very difficult for us, you know, because so much of our food has maybe naturally added sugars like fruit. It's our biggest example. So just trying to be mindful of some of the foods that you're eating and definitely trying to work, add other things in addition to like, let's say when you enjoy an ice cream, just making sure that you have dinner first or in the, the biggest example is a lot of our breakfast foods have are very, very much high in sugar, trying to kind of counteract that with maybe like a protein that slows down an mm -hmm. insulin spike, like having a little bit of eggs with it. Just, um, that's just one example, or trying to incorporate maybe some vegetables later in the day at lunch. Gotcha. And what is your take on those, the typical um, energy drinks like Monster and Red Bull. I just like cringe when I think about. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely not my, my thing. I'm very terrified of having, I already get very, um, what's the word like jippity with, um, yeah. even caffeinated coffee, like just coffee to begin with. So I know that there are people out there who drink them. I, my best advice is to keep it in moderation as, as much as you possibly can, because 
I don't know if you've heard the news, but there's been so many stories, especially with younger people lately drinking Celsius, which is one of the new um, caffeinated drinks and ending up in the hospital because they're going, they're drinking and then they're going to the gym and then their, their blood pressure's up and there's not any balance in there. So with, with those, I, it's very important to just limit the amount and um, recognize that it is very dangerous to, to have too much of it. Yeah. Too much is definitely not a good thing. Oh my gosh, Patricia, this has been such an amazing conversation. I so wish Carol Sue was here and I know she'll be listening to this, of course. I hope you will definitely consider coming back. Absolutely. That would be so much fun. And I'm, I'm enjoying this as well. I love talking about nutrition. I could go on forever. <laughs> oh, I, I could go on forever as well. Oh my gosh. I can't thank you enough. And you know, you provided such valuable information in a short amount of time. We do need to um, continue this conversation. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh my gosh. And we both look forward to having you on again. No, thank you. And I thank you for having me. And I, I'm looking forward to it. You're so welcome. Well, folks, fantabulous Friday. And did we not receive a lot of fantastic information? Um, oh, one further question. I almost forgot. And I do apologize. How do our viewers and listeners get in contact with you? Yeah, absolutely. So the we a website is currently in the works, but you can follow me on both Instagram and TikTok. It's my username is at the dietitian, spelled D I E T I T I A N, followed by dish. So it's at the dietitian dish. Oh, I like that. It, that's got a ring to it. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I'll have to follow you on TikTok as well. Um, I just set that up. It's at podcast diva, of course, because I'm a wellness diva. Now I'm a podcast diva. There we go. Exactly. And on that note, thank you again. Fantabulous Friday. We hope that you have a great weekend. And remember, no Celsius, no energy drinks. <laughs> Be careful out there. Thank you all so much. And we'll see you again real soon. This is Janice, aka Wellness Diva with two sisters. Bye for now.